So good morning and welcome to this session in the Shape Your Future series, where we are exploring the STEM career journeys of Australia's rising stars. Today, we'll be hearing from Dr. Kate Murphy. I'm Dr. Amal Damir. I'm a medical doctor working on improving heart health, and I'm also part of the Catalyst program at the Academy of Technology and Engineering. As we gather from around Australia, I'd first like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands from which we meet. I'm joining you today from Nugunawal and Namri land. I pay respect to elders past and present and to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who join us online today. As we share and discuss our own knowledge and practices, we acknowledge the deep knowledge forever embedded in custodianship of country. Before we get into this session, you would have seen that this is being recorded. This and all talks in this series will be available on the Stellar YouTube channel for you to revisit anytime. There's also a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. If you have any questions, drop them in there and we will get to them either during the talk or in the discussion at the end. There's also a chat function, but any questions should be in the Q&A section. Finally, you'll be sent feedback a feedback form after this session to the email you registered with. Please let us know what went well and what you might like to see in our series next year. Now I'd like to introduce Dr. Kate Murphy to tell us how she came to be working on muscular diseases. Thanks so much, Kate. Thank you. Good afternoon to everyone. Will I get this up and running? Uh, so it's lovely to be invited to talk to you all today. And I'm very excited to share my journey uh, and the research that we do. So I am a um, full-time researcher, a postdoctoral fellow at the Centre for Muscle Research in the Department of Anatomy and Physiology at the University of Melbourne. Um, but it hasn't been a straightforward journey to get here. So I did year 12 many, many years ago before most of you were born. Um, and I did, um, I thought it'd be good to give you a background of, of the subjects I did. So English, methods, um, PE, psychology and Chinese. And I actually didn't enjoy science in high school. Um, and so as you can see, there were no traditional science subjects there. Um, but I have a photo here um, of me doing triathlon, actually, because at, at the stage during year 12, I was more focused on my athletic endeavours. I was doing triathlon almost full time. And so when I was thinking about um, university and my career wise, um, I was more focused, I guess, on, on my uh, athletics rather than university per se. However, I did know during year 12 that I really enjoyed the psychology and PE and that um, maybe a sports science or something like that was something that uh, I'd be just interested in looking at at university. And so I was advised that the most appropriate course for me would be at Deakin doing a Bachelor of Sports Science in Sports Coaching and Administration. And uh, that was the course that I got into. So I spent three years at Deakin doing this. Again, the first couple of years, I was more focused on um, training and racing, uh, but some career injuries um, put a stop to that in the last year or so. And so my shock my focus then shifted towards my university studies and I realised I really enjoyed the research component. So I would spend um, hours in the library at the university just sitting there reading textbooks or theses and it was some physiology subjects, re research-based ones that I really found a lot of enjoyment. And so I decided that I'd like to try to pursue a research career following my undergraduate and I was lucky enough, I applied to do honours. So what you can do after your undergraduate degree, if you're interested in doing research, then you can either do a one-year honours degree or you could do a two-year master's degree. And so I applied to do honours at Deakin, uh, but it was highly competitive and I didn't get in. But luckily, my name was um, given to a, an associate professor at Victoria University uh, Professor Mark McKenna, and he contacted me to see if, if I was interested in doing honours with him. And so 
this is one of those, um, I think, life-changing moments where an op in your life where an opportunity arises and you can either take it or obviously not take it. Uh, and so this is something that I pursued and, and it really changed the direction of my life. So I, I moved over to um, Victoria University over in Footscray to undertake a one-year research project. And so my research was on the effects of exercise on the sodium potassium pump in human skeletal muscle. And you don't need to know anything about the sodium potassium pump because I didn't either when I started, but certainly by the end of the year, I became um, uh, not quite an expert, but certainly very well versed in it. And I enjoyed my honours year so much uh, and did well enough that I was able to secure a scholarship to do a PhD. So um, whereas honours is one year or, or master's is two years, PhD is typically three year research project. And so I continued this at Victoria University uh, for three years and it was very much a, a similar theme to my honours where I was looking at exercise and the sodium potassium pump that's important for how muscles work. And so these are a few photos. So we mainly did um, studies in untrained and trained human subjects. We would collect blood samples before, during and after exercise and also muscle biopsies at these same time points. And this picture down here is um, actually of my leg. I was the subject for many of my studies where we would, um, a doctor would give me a local anesthetic and then would put a needle into the leg and take out a little bit of muscle tissue, which we could analyze for the levels of different genes and proteins that we're interested in. And so um, this was some great, a really great time in my life. We were very productive. I made lots of lifelong friends. But probably during the second year, I realized there were some questions that I had about my research that I couldn't answer in human subjects. And I had, I'd always said that I would only do studies in humans and I wouldn't do studies in animal models. But I realized that to answer these questions um, regarding muscle biology, I need an entire muscle. And so I really needed to move to animal models. And I was fortunate to be given the opportunity to go to Denmark for a couple of months in my last year of my PhD to do some studies in rat models. And so we would we were able to take out an entire muscle uh, we could string the muscle up into, I'll show you here, this is a schematic. So we could take out the entire muscle, string it up in a bath. We could give it um, different drugs that we were interested in and measure how much force this muscle, muscle could generate and whether the treatments that we gave it could change the force. And so we're really able to answer a lot of the questions that I had that couldn't be answered in human patients. And you can see here that my time in Denmark during this period was certainly in winter because my beautiful view out the window was of these snow covered lawns. Uh, it was certainly very different to um, growing up in Melbourne, although today like these is not too dis dissimilar. So um, I really loved my my time in Denmark and in March 2005, I think I, I handed my PhD and I pretty much straight away jumped on a plane uh, because I was given an opportunity to spend a couple of years over in, in Denmark at the same laboratory. And so uh, the way it works after you finish your PhD, um, you can do a postdoctoral position, which again is just research based position for someone who has already got their PhD. And so this is the, the building that I worked in over in Denmark. You can see this photo was taken in autumn because we have the beautiful red autumn leaves. You'll also note the many bikes here, of course, in Scandinavia. People ride their bikes everywhere, and so did I. So you'd ride to work, to the shops. If you went clubbing, you'd ride home. Uh, it was a really great way to live. Um, again, there's uh, some other photos, non-work related, a view from my apartment in winter. I used to run in this beautiful forest each morning uh, and even during winter, which you can see up here, and there were snow covered deer um, around me. Uh, so it was a very unique experience um, for someone coming from Australia. But work-wise was also extremely productive. Uh, this is my supervisor during my time in Denmark, Professor Torben Clausen. And Torben at the time was pretty much the world expert in the sodium potassium pump, so the main protein that I was working on. 
Uh, and he, when he was a PhD student, his supervisor was Professor Yen Skoll over in the left in this picture. And Professor Skoll actually won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry for his discovery of the sodium potassium pump. And when I worked in Denmark, Professor Skoll at 90 plus years of age still came to work most days and still rode his bike most days. And his, his office was just up the corridor from me. So I'd see this Nobel Prize winner uh, most days of the week and it was very, very inspiring for my research. Um, so although it was a, a very productive time and I really enjoyed um, my, my work in Denmark, towards the end of 2006, my sister gave birth to uh, my first nephew or the, the first grandchild in the family and I was quite homesick at this time as well and so I decided it was time to move back to Australia. I wanted to be around for my nephew growing up. And so um, here I go, jumping back on a plane again, all the way back to Melbourne. And fortunately, I was able to secure another postdoctoral position, this time at the University of Melbourne. And that was in about June 2007, and I've been here ever since. And so when I joined the group, it was a single group led by in the red t-shirt here, Professor Gordon Lynch. Um, but a couple of years ago, we formed, um, a couple of groups came together and we've formed what is now known as the Centre for Muscle Research. And we are aiming to be um, not only the, the hub of muscle biology research in Australia, but the world as well. And so um, we've got collaborators throughout the world um, that we work with. And um, I'll talk to you a little bit more about, oh, you can see here some links we have to our Facebook page, the website, and I believe we're also on Twitter, but I'm not on Twitter, so I haven't given the link for that. Um, but what do we do? So as I mentioned, we really, we aim to make fundamental discoveries in muscle biology. We want to know how muscles work and if they don't work properly, so in various diseases, what happens to the muscle to make it not work well? So try to work out the mechanisms. And then if we can work out the mechanisms or what's gone wrong, we can then design and test therapies to either slow down or hopefully, hopefully prevent the muscle wasting or weakness that can occur. So why are we interested in skeletal muscle? Well, it actually makes up about 40% of your entire body weight. And you can see here the muscles shown in red. So there are throughout our body, most of you will be aware you need muscles to move, but muscles also generate heat. So they're particularly important on days like these. Um, and of course, they're required to survive. The heart is a muscle, respiratory muscles too. We, we need to, to live and work and eat and breathe. And so that's why we're interested in them. But what happens or what are the consequences when muscles start weakening or getting smaller? Well, there's many of these consequences. Of course, you get a reduced strength and you get more fatigable, so more tired. Um, you can lose your mobility, so your ability to walk and maybe your independence, you need to rely on more people to help you. Um, in people in the workforce, particularly those in um, labour intensive works, it might lead to people having to re retire prematurely. And overall, it can just recruit, reduce quality of life. In people with cancer, muscle wasting can actually reduce the effectiveness of cancer treatments like chemotherapy. And in the worst, most severe cases, if you get a failure of the heart muscle or of the respiratory muscles, it can lead to death. And so that's why we feel it's really important to try to identify what happens uh, in muscles when they are in these different conditions that cause them to waste away. And therefore, can we produce medicines that slow it down or prevent the wasting? And so this, this figure just shows some of the different conditions that we're interested in. Uh, so the muscular dystrophies we're interested in, these are genetic conditions. Um, I mentioned before that cancer, many different types of cancers can actually lead to muscle wasting or weakness and interfere with the chemotherapy treatment. Space flight, um, of course, a reduction in, or sorry, zero gravity, uh, means that astronauts, their muscles can waste away while they're in space. And so this is a figure I've just put here. These shows um, 
on the left here pre-flight, so before an astronaut goes into space. This is um, a muscle biopsy was taken from patients, or from astronauts, and these little circles, the individual muscle fibres, the white ones are slow muscle fibres, so muscles involved in endurance type events, whereas the black ones are the the fast twitch muscle fibers so muscle fibers that are needed for speed and sprinting and what you can see is after they've been into space that the muscle particularly the black fast muscle fibers are a lot smaller so these fibers reduce and there's a lot of work that goes into trying to design strategies to prevent this muscle wasting for astronauts so they have treadmills in their spaceships of course they'll need uh, weighted belts uh, because of gravity to keep them on the treadmill um, but certainly exercise can not prevent but slow down some of the wasting for astronauts uh, injury is another one um, and I'll jump over to limb casting too I've fractured my elbow last week so I'm currently in a sling and uh, I know that my arm is wasting away while I'm not using it. So I'm certainly very interested and I'm doing whatever I can to prevent some of the, the wasting that my arm is currently going through. Um, and aging as well in the, the top corner. So a lot of you, if you think about your grandparents, you might have some grandparents who are getting older. They're perhaps losing mobility and becoming more fragile. And although things like exercise can slow these processes, it certainly can't prevent them. And one last thing is that there's more research now that some patients that get COVID uh, have what is known as a myopathy or um, long-term effects on their muscles. So fatigue and weakness of their muscles too. And so there's an increasing amount of research going into this. And as I mentioned, we're, we want to know uh, what's happening within the muscle to cause these and then test therapies. And I'll just show a couple of examples of this. So these are in our mouse models of different conditions. The top one is in a mouse model um, of limb casting for two weeks. And this is our control here. Again, these circles, are individual muscle fibers. And what you can see in the casted mice, so mice that have been casted for two weeks, the individual muscle fibers are actually smaller but if we gave them a treatment during this two week period, we're able to prevent the muscles getting smaller. And the same is also true in our mice with cancer. Again, you can see the muscles are smaller, or the muscle fibers are smaller, but with this particular treatment, we were not only able to prevent this decrease in size of the muscle fibers, but when we assess the actual strength of them, we were found we were able to prevent the weakness that occurred. And in a mouse model of muscular dystrophy, this time the muscle fibers are in yellow. Uh, it's a little bit hard to see, but the, the fibers are smaller in this mouse model. Uh, but again, with this particular treatment, we could uh, slow down or uh, prevent some of the wasting of these fibers. So um, I, I thought I'd just let you know about some of my tasks as a researcher and what I do day to day. Um, there's many different aspects to it. The main ones are in blue. Uh, and my main role really is to plan and conduct studies. Once we finish a study, we then need to report the findings. So this is generally in a publication. We'll write up a manuscript and get it published and presentation of our findings to uh, at conferences. Uh, but of course, none of this can happen without money to fund both the salary of myself and people that work for me as well as to actually fund our studies. And so uh, a massive part of my work is to try to write grant applications to secure funding. Other jobs, uh, I supervise students, honours, masters and PhD students. Uh, I sometimes lecture to undergraduate students, promote science to the community, which I'm doing right now, which I love. Uh, and of course, reviewing other grants and manuscripts submitted by different investigators. And finally, I just wanted to touch on um, what I think are the pros of my job and also the cons of my job. Um, so I love research. I think I'm super lucky that my hobby is my job. There's, I don't know too many people that can say that. I like to think that maybe one day, well, we're either making a difference or one day we will make a difference. Um, there's a lot of independence in my job and a freedom of working hours. I tend to start about 5.30 in the morning. 
so that I can do school pickup in the afternoon for my children. There's a lot of variety, as I showed you before, there's different aspects of the job, no day is ever the same. Meet a lot of people and get to travel to a lot of places too. Um, what I've shown here with the red uh, pins are just some of the places I've traveled to for work, either conducting studies or for conferences or presentations. And then the black ones are where I've joined in um, a holiday on these, on these uh, work trips as well. So it's really taken me around the world. Uh, one highlight of this was back in 2014, where I got to go to Germany to meet, to a conference where 38 Nobel Prize winners got together uh, with some young re researchers from around the world. And not only did we get to hear them talk and share stories of their journey, we got to have lunch and dinner with these guests and ask some one-on-one -on -one questions. And my son was one at the time, so he got to come along and meet some of these Nobel laureates too. And as I mentioned, I think it's still important to, to let you know about some cons of my job, but it would be remiss if I, if I didn't mention this. Um, and it's not a nine to five job. It's big, I feel you pretty much, you live your job because you're constantly thinking about research, you're thinking about the next experimental question and how you can answer it. So sometimes, sometimes it can be difficult to escape mentally, um, but it's also one reason I love my job. <laughs> there is little job security. So we are always applying for the next grant to fund our work and it does seem to be getting harder. And it is often still male dominated. Certainly there's a lot better equality now than when I first started in research. Um, and we are making great gains, but it can still be male dominated and that can bring some challenges. But as I mentioned, we are certainly getting better at that. So I welcome any questions. Oh, thank you so much, Kate. That was fantastic to see your journey from high school and then all the way to Denmark and in detail the work that you do. So thank you. Um, we have a few questions and not questions that have popped up. Uh, one is, is it better to have more fast muscles or slow muscles? That's a great question. And it depends on uh, your end goal, really. So I'm an endurance athlete. So for me, it's better to have more slow muscles. These are muscles that uh, may not produce massive forces, but they're resistant to fatigue or a lot more resistant to fatigue than fast twitch muscle fibers. However, a sprinter, Usain Bolt, uh, would say it's certainly better to have fast twitch muscle fibers. They're the very fast explosive muscle, muscle fibers that generate energy very quickly. However, they are more fatigable as well. So really depends on um, your athletic endeavors, I guess. Uh, what is interesting is that most of, it's generally genetic, whether you've got fast twitch or more fast twitch or more slow twitch muscle fibers, uh, you can change them to a certain extent with training or things like altitude. Uh, but generally, it's you need to choose your parents correctly if you want to be good in a particular sport. All right. And we have the next question. Do you get to do much sport these days? It's a good question. <laughs> it's a very good question. When I don't break my arm, I do. <laughs> so I try to train every day. Um, I, I have three children, so I find it hard to fit in riding. Um, but I try to either swim or run each day. Um, but at the moment, I'm limited to walking. So I'm hoping the next five or so weeks go very fast because I can't wait to get back into the pool. All right, so I have a question. Uh, out of curiosity, when you mentioned that astronauts have muscle wasting when they go to space, do we know how long before uh, those muscle changes occur? How much space, how much time do you have to be in space before it happens? Uh, it's a really great question. And unfortunately, it happens very fast. Mm -hmm. So most of the changes occur within the first week or two, and then it plateaus down. And that's why okay. I'm very aware 
one week today after fracturing my arm um, that this week and next week are, are, um, are essential for trying to maintain the mass. So it happens very, very fast. And that's why obviously astronauts, they do a lot of training before they go into space to get themselves as primed as possible. Um, but from the moment they leave, really they've started interventions to try to keep that muscle mass going. Wow, I didn't know that. Thank Very you. Very fast. <laughs> yeah. um, so do we have any more questions coming in? Uh, we have one more. How many people are working in your team? Yeah, it's a great answer as well. Uh, in my direct team, so uh, in the cancer cachexia field, my group, um, there's probably about five or six of us. In um, our lab, there gosh, must be about 15 or 16, but then within the entire Centre for Muscle Research, uh, I think there's probably about 20 to 25 people. So that's a mixture of um, professor, so director of the, the, of the centre uh, and a deputy director, and then a couple underneath that, uh, a couple of people leading or postdocs leading their own research groups. And then we have our honours, masters and PhD students. Another question about the end goal of the research. Um. Please tell us. Can't see yeah. that. That's yes. okay. Yeah. Um, so there was a question about what's the end goal of my research? Uh, is it to make sure we have healthy muscles for the whole of our lives? 100%. Uh, that is the end goal. Um, because there are so many different consequences of having muscles that do waste and waste away or weaken. Um, not only for a person's quality of life, but even just on healthcare. So uh, you think about hospital beds, I mean, our hospitals are completely overloaded at the moment with different patients. Uh, and so if we're able to keep a couple of patients out of hospital, um, certainly for the elderly, stronger muscles means less chance to fall and fracture themselves, which would cause them to go to hospital. So, you know, strengthening muscles can reduce, hopefully, hospitalizations, healthcare costs, et cetera. Um, so that's definitely end goal, but not only it's at the end of life, it's also early on in life too, that we're interested. So I referred to muscular dystrophies before, um, some of those muscular dystrophies, Duchenne muscular dystrophy in particular, which is generally diagnosed when boys are about four or five years of age, um, and can lead to them being in a, a wheelchair by the time they're 10 and, and, uh, many other severe consequences, you know, we want to try to improve the quality of life of these little boys as they grow up and also prolong their lifespan too. That's a very worthwhile cause. Thank you for sharing that. So we have a few questions from Atsi. What's been the most interesting thing to work on? Oh dear. <laughs> I think there are lots. Uh, I mean, my most of my work is around cancer and the muscle wasting in cancer um so i find that very interesting but also i referred to the muscular dystrophies before and we were extremely fortunate to have a phd student in our center who had duchenne muscular dystrophy and his research was on muscular dystrophy and so um he was inspirational and every day his journey reminded us of why we were doing research and why it was so important to do research. He sadly passed away just before he submitted his PhD, um, but he continues to inspire us. Um, and I guess another area of research I've got into recently is looking at muscles in some neurodegenerative conditions. So um, conditions like Parkinson's where the brain is obviously affected, but secondary effects include the muscles wasting away and the mobility. And that's important to me because um, my father recently passed away of a condition that was similar to Parkinson's. Um, and so I think 
those diseases where it's close to the heart, of course, um, probably feel the most important to me. Wow, that's, um, that's a great reason why, uh, why anyone would be inspired to do research um, and to go on with it, um, especially when you see the impact that it can do to make lives better. Yes, and that's, that is the end goal, absolutely. Right. Yeah. Um, so what would, you what would you have told your high school self? Uh, I think I mentioned that I actually didn't enjoy science in high school, yet here I am a scientist now. Uh, and so uh, university was a challenge because I really had to teach myself a lot of science. And I think the reason I didn't enjoy it is it wasn't applied to anything I was interested in at the time. Uh, so if the science back then had been applied to, to, to sport or athletic performance, um, I think I really would have been a lot more interested in pursuing it. And so I do work with some schools and, and teachers, and that's something that I do like to get across to, to make sure the science is meaningful um, to students or that students can apply the science they're learning to something that they're interested and passionate about. Um, so I think that's what I would really tell my high school self to um, perhaps think outside the box, try to apply what I was learning to things I was interested in. And I think the other, the other thing I would say is to have confidence in myself. I actually didn't have enough confidence in myself then to um, probably to, to pursue things that I, I, I could have pursued. I, I didn't believe that perhaps I was smart enough or had the ability to. So yeah, just believing in yourself. Uh, there is another question uh, about people around the world. Can't see that. <laughs> so there's a, <laughs> there is another question saying, um, I work with people around the world. How important is that? Super important. Um, several people around the world, but one in particular in Florida, in America that we've been working with, who um, that's mainly on our cancer work. So he has... He actually works with cancer patients. And so things or results that we're finding in mice, he's able to check those in cancer patients and see if what we're finding in the mice is also true in the humans. And therefore, does our, do our results actually, are they important for, for people or not? Um, not only that, that they have different models, just they have different ideas, um, also different funding opportunities. So our collaborators in America, they can apply for grants with us on it, uh, American grants that we couldn't apply for otherwise to help fund our work and vice versa too. Um, so there's lots of different opportunities. We can actually also have our students visit each other's labs. So a couple of months over in a, a lab in America or for an American student over in Australia too. And that's really great opportunity for our students. Oh, and again, I'm sorry to take over. I'm just not sure. I don't think you can see some of the questions. <laughs> There's another one about um, what's the hardest thing about what I do. But oh, please take over. I think you can't see them. No, not yet. I saw the I saw the previous question after you picked it up. So okay, okay. Yeah. You seem so, to be sorry. Getting the early. <laughs> Take over. Yeah. Okay. Um, what's the hardest thing about what I do? Gosh, that's a great question. Um, hmm. I think there are some hard things. You know, the the long hours weekends we need to work, um, particularly trying to juggle it around children, but. I think the hardest thing, but also what I do love, I referred to before, is that I'm always thinking about work, always trying to think about, oh, we had that result. What does that mean? Or how can we test that in the next, next experiment? So ah, I think um, I find that the hardest, just trying to sometimes get out of that work space and be in the present moment. Um, but apart from that, yeah, physically, maybe some of the, the longer hours, although I don't tend to do that as much now. 
Uh, and I guess the other hard thing emotionally probably is, is needing to apply for grants. And um, probably for every one grant that's successful, there might be nine or so that are unsuccessful. So there is a lot of, I guess, rejection uh, in this field just because it is so competitive. But you learn very early on to be resilient and to dust yourself off and get going on the next grant application. And one will eventually be successful and pay off. I can't see any others. Okay, neither can I. <laughs> um, so is there another thing you would have become if you weren't a scientist? Oh, I think in hindsight, I would have loved to have done medicine <laughs> and be a doctor. Um, yeah, uh, and this comes back to perhaps me not having belief in myself. Um, and again, I was very focused on triathlon. So I wasn't looking to do perhaps those extra subjects or maybe those harder subjects or the necessary subjects to get me into medicine. But uh, in hindsight, I think I would have absolutely loved that. And I guess that's the other, the other point that um, what you get into after school doesn't necessarily dictate what your future career will be. You can always um, you know, go back to different study or move around. My journey certainly hasn't been linear. Uh, it's been kind of this way and that way and um, everywhere up and down. But I also wouldn't change it because I learnt lots at every single step. Uh, and I'm very, I feel very fortunate to be in this career where I am now. Oh, there is another question. Um, yep, we've got another one. Do you ever work with sportsmen or sportswomen to help them build muscle? Yeah, uh, no, is the, the question. Um, but a lot of our research can be applied to that area. Um, but we don't. Um, but again, I, I do know, especially in the past, we did a lot of work on something called beta agonists, which are used um, by certain people to build their muscles up. And, but we have used them in the context of ageing and a couple of other different conditions where it was helpful. Um, but not, not every treatment that will be beneficial in a condition of wasting will also be beneficial in the context of healthy sports people. Um, but certainly I, I know that um, a lot of athletes do look at some of the re research to see whether it can be applied to them or not. Uh, I certainly haven't applied anything that we've found to my own sporting performance. Okay, I think that's all the questions we've had in the time we have. So thank you for joining us and sharing your journey with us, Kate. And thank you also for tuning in. This series of talks was supported by the Victorian Challenge and Enrichment Series. Don't forget to fill out our feedback form after you leave this session. The Shape Your Future series will be continuing all this year. So you can tune in to hear from many more scientists. All the information is on the Stellar and AdSea websites. Thank you and have a lovely day.